Hi, welcome to Talk About the Passion. My name is Christian Campagna, and this is episode number 41, Even in His Youth. I named this episode after the Nirvana song of the same name. The actual lyrics to that song have nothing to do with my guest story, but the title of it seemed to fit as we talk about his passion for radio that is still just as strong today. So my guest today is Dwayne Bruce. Dwayne has been a friend of mine for many years. I met Dwayne when he was a DJ at WFNX, and he introduced me and millions of listeners to a ton of great music, on air and off. This is a passion of Dwayne's that we trace back to him growing up in Maine, where radio is where he also discovered a lot of great music, and then himself became involved in radio up there. Dwayne's a great storyteller, and there's some great stuff about radio in Maine that I never knew about. And of course, any good story about Maine is going to maybe have an appearance by author Stephen King. King shows up in Dwayne's journey at one point, and that story is pretty funny and uh, maybe a little scary. I was recently in Portland, Maine for a concert, the band Sleep, if you care, on a Saturday night. I got in touch with Dwayne a week or so before and told him I, I would be there for the weekend. So before I headed back down to Massachusetts on that Sunday, uh, we set this up and recorded this episode. I think it came out great. And the other reason I named this episode after the Nirvana song is, you know, they come up quite a bit in this episode. Dwayne introduced them on stage the first time I saw them at uh, Man Ray in Cambridge, Mass. in 1989. This was uh, a year or so after their first show here at uh, Green Street Station. He mentions me taking photographs at this particular show, uh, which I wish I still had the negatives for. I loaned them to someone at one point who uh, to make prints, and they've since passed on, so I will most likely never see those again. Uh, there is a recording of that show you can find online, and Dwayne mentions how to find that as well as how to listen to his newest radio show, American Debauchery, which to me captures the very essence of radio, you know, when I fell in love with it as a kid, an almost you know lost art form that Dwayne's definitely uh, keeping alive here. And speaking of debauchery, Dwayne also has a great book out called Hang the DJ, which ple- features plenty of, of, of that and, and some amazing stories that are you know sometimes hard to believe. He tells you how to find that book and uh, more on this episode. A couple more things and I'll let you go. You can listen to this podcast on Apple Podcasts, Google Play, Spotify. These even get uploaded to YouTube if you're one of those types of people. Just search for Talk About the Passion podcast and make sure to include the word podcast or else you'll get stuck listening to that R.E.M. song, which is a fine enough song that I, you know, even named my podcast after, but I'm generally more of like a South Central Rain type of a guy. I'm on social media and I do updates there regularly. And by social media, I basically mean Facebook and Instagram. Just search again, uh, Talk About the Passion podcast and you should be able to find me there. Okay, let's get this started. Here we go with episode number 41, Dwayne Bruce, even in his youth. Thanks for listening. So here I am with uh, Dwayne Bruce. We're here in the lovely state of Maine on uh, this wonderful Easter Sunday. How are, how are you doing today? I'm well, Christian. Thank you so much. Welcome to my home. Welcome to the state of Maine, home of the whoopie pie, <laughs> where uh, everybody gets a whoopie pie just for coming in. When you pay your first toll, they give you back your change yeah, and yeah. a whoopie pie. Yeah, I already had mine on the way up here. So uh, so where did, where did you grow up, Dwayne? I was born in Pennsylvania, but uh, at age 10, I moved to Maine. My dad was originally from Arusta County in Maine, so he had gone to Pennsylvania, I think, to work like on a brother's farm or something like right. that and he met my mom there they got married I was born my sister was born and then around 1970 we lived so close to uh, the highway mm-hmm. which I think was route 80 uh, and they were allowing triple tractor trailers at mm-hmm. the time yeah. which is completely insane <laughs> double is bad enough right. single is yeah. enough to contend with in the rain right I mean you get a chain of two or three going by <laughs> and you know that's nine box cars yeah yeah. And you can't get back into the lane <laughs> or go anywhere. So right. my parents were just kind of like, I think for the safety of everybody, we know that they're not doing that in Maine. We know that it's pure and clean because we uh, came to Maine every summer. Yeah. When I was growing up, we would go up to Matawankeg Lake, mm-hmm. which is pretty close to Mount Katahdin. Mm-hmm. And 
so, you know, we loved it, and we moved to Maine, and that's where I graduated, was out of Skowhegan, Maine, which is a little podunk town. If yeah. you threw a dart at the <laughs> state of Maine map you and hit it in the middle, that's pretty much um, where, the, where the town is, and that's where I grew up and graduated high school and did all my stuff, started radio there okay. at a... Uh, a 50,000 watt station, which is not normally what you get to start right. your radio career. You're usually much right. farther down, but it happened to be in the town. Nice. Happened to be a rock and roll station <clears throat> that I had grown up on. By the way, it's WTOS FM. Mm-hmm. Um, now it, it's still in existence. It's uh, 105.1 FM. But when I ran the music aspect of it when I was the music director. Yeah. Uh, it was an alternative station, although right. we'd still played, um, you know, some classic rock that really wasn't classic rock at that time. The, right. the Moody Blues, they had a current record out, right. you know, in your wildest dreams. And yeah. So you'd play that or the new Tom Petty or right. the new Who or, or whatever, whoever was putting stuff out, but yeah. mixed it up with Psychedelic Furs, Sex Pistols, Ramones, yeah. Early Jesus and Mary Chain, even uh, as far as Jane's Addiction. I yeah. think that album, Nothing Shocking, came out the week that I left oh, TOS. Okay. Right. So um, that was a good batch of music yeah, yeah. to deliver to the minds of the people in Maine yeah. that otherwise were stuck listening to, you know, Neil Diamond yeah, and yeah. Uh, James uh, Taylor right. and yeah. whatever the radio had to offer at that time. So I was very pleased to do that. Yeah. And uh, it gave me a good start. I started at the bottom of that station as an intern and worked my way up to the music director before uh, someone came and purchased the station and kept it a rock station, but not the rock station that I could work for. I I had no desire to play Bon Jovi and Leonard uh, Leonard Skinner type stuff. It just didn't appeal to me that, that because... It's not that that's bad music. Right. For those that like it, more power to you. It's not my particular yeah, thing. Yeah. But you can turn the dial and you can hear it. Find and you it, can it turn is. the dial again and hear it. Yeah. You know, so I wanted to offer something different, as did the predecessors who worked yeah. ahead of me at that station who laid the, the tracks down yeah. to be able to have yeah. an alternative station. So when a band like R.E.M. and U2 came around and The Cure, yeah. we were ready for them, and yeah. they became... Almost house bands. REM was really a house band for that station because uh, Annie Earhart, the music director before myself, Mm -hmm. was the, oh, what what would you call it? She read the charts for Michael Stipe. Yeah. You know, not the music charts. I'm talking celestial charts. Oh, oh, really? So, yes. So she was like the spiritual guider for Michael and probably in some aspect the band you know yeah. if she said this was remember how uh nancy reagan would yeah. would say to ron reagan you know you can't do that on this thursday right. because <laughs> you know mercury's in retrograde and yeah. it will just you know it'll backfire it'll, yeah. so she had that same type of swing with them i right. think so so going backwards though did, uh you know you doing a service for maine people you growing up as a kid in maine how did you discover all this stuff was it was it radio it started Probably radio around 73 or so when the FM band really kicked in. Yeah. And the station that I eventually wound up working for yeah. became prominent yeah. uh, on the dial. Mm-hmm. And certainly with a 50,000 watt signal broadcasting from the top of Sugarloaf, that's what TOS stood for. Yeah. Uh-huh. Uh, I mean, so we were covering three states yeah. and seven Canadian provinces. We were number one in Canadian provinces where we didn't even sell advertising oh, wow. because the station was so strong and so unique. Yeah. Even Canadian people were like, we're, they're not playing enough REM right. here. You know, we've <laughs> got to play 30% Canadian right. content at the time. Right. <clears throat> so... Um, growing up, yeah, I would listen to that station, and before that, the AM station, WSKW, that was in town. Yeah. And uh, my dad became like a fishing buddy and a drinking buddy with this guy named Dutch Heiser, who did mornings on first the AM and then the FM okay. when it kicked in. But I would be able to go to his house oh, wow. or you know, hang out with him or go fishing with him. Yeah. Or uh, once he invited me to the station and once... I was inside there and actually in the studio and saw how he did it. Even though I was only 14 or 15 at the time, it had a really big impact on me because I thought, this is what 
I'm hearing out there. Yeah. He's doing all of this in front of me now, and I have no clue that that's going on, but I'm out there yeah, listening yeah. in my car or right. in my home. Yeah. I didn't realize there was such a job to yeah. it yeah, and yeah. that you had to have a certain work ethic if you were going to continue that pace and not have dead air. Yeah. It was like driving a car. Right. It really was. You're constantly yeah. checking your mirrors. You're constantly looking at the gauges. Am I going too fast? Do I have enough gas? What's right. coming up? Am I going to take this left or this right? right? All of those things come into play when you're doing radio. You've got to pull your commercials. Now everything's on computer, right. so it just runs automatically. You touch a button to start. You touch a button to stop, and right. that's it. Yeah. Back then... You know, we had these four-track carts yeah, yeah. that the commercials were on. They looked like eight-track carts, yeah, but they were yeah. four-track. And you'd load about six of those, and you had to have them pulled out and make sure that you've got I'm the right crazy. spot. Because if you've got six Chevy spots in front of you and you right. you need to run the one for Easter Sunday, yeah. then you want to make sure that you're running the right one. So, And you've always had to have your music pulled ahead. and yeah. uh, Excuse me. Especially if you are in charge of the music, if you're the one who's picking what you're playing. Yeah. It's one thing to be given a list and follow it. That's right. pretty easy. That's, yeah. that's monkey play. Right. But when your brain has to conceive, uh, hey, what's going to sound next? What, I mean, what's going to sound good next coming up af- out of this song? Right, segues. Yeah. And right. that's another thing that I miss in radio is, is the art of the segue. Yeah. A computer does, you know, a two or three second segue, right. if even. Yeah, yeah. I came from a time when a DJ would do like a 20-second segue between two songs, a fade-up and a fade-out, and somewhere in the middle there's a crisscross and a blend, and maybe you caught it and maybe you didn't. Right, yeah. Or the talking over, like, uh, you know, instrumental music, so that's quietly in the background. Exactly. I I always enjoyed that. it, It was a whole different era, a whole different time you could experiment with things. That's what FM radio really was, was yeah. Uh, experimental. Yeah. Now, do you remember sort of the first uh, music that hit you that w- when you said, you know, this is sort of my my passion? Yeah, life. definitely. That would be the Beatles. Yeah. That's what uh, I mean. The first band yeah. right out, out of the gate. Yeah. But around that, too, I mean, um, Tommy James and the Shondells, for some reason, Crimson and Clover and yeah. Crystal Blue Persuasion, maybe it's because... They didn't sound like every other right. record on the radio that they stuck out to me. Yeah. Uh, and then, like, David Essex, Rock On. Oh, yeah. yeah. Things that just had that quirky sound. Yeah. Mm-hmm. DOA from Blood Rock. Yeah. Do you remember that song? We were, no, uh, no. Uh, it's a really weird, warped ambulance song about yeah. these guys that crash in a plane, and yeah. he, he's dying, but they're telling him that he's going to live, and he's in the back <laughs> of the ambulance, the whole song, and the, yeah. and the ambulance is going, wee, wee. <laughs> and then it like slows down to next to nothing and you know that he dies at the end because yeah. the ambulance dies. Right. <laughs> and it was like a seven minute song from yeah. Blood Rock. And, it, you know, they play it on uh, the station in my town at midnight. Yeah. And it would scare the shit out of me. Yeah. Because I'm a little kid. I'm, you know, yeah. I'm in my bed and I know it's coming. Yeah. But uh, you'll, you'll have to check that out. I yeah, think you would really like that. Yeah. Uh, there wasn't much more to Blood Rock um, yeah, yeah. after that. But, <laughs> but the Beatles have always sort of been your... Yeah, the Beatles, yeah. especially John Lennon as I got older. I mean, everybody has their favorite, but Lennon just um, took over me because of the the education that he gave me about yeah. being a smarter person, about being a more worldly person, about not caring about people's religion, their right. sexuality, their hairstyle, yeah. whether they've got a sleeve of tattoos or whether they don't have any. Right. It doesn't matter. People are people. They're going to be who they are. Yeah. And if they interest you, Enough, get involved with them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Everybody is different in some form or fashion. Yeah. Everybody has their quirks. Everybody has their foibles. Everybody has their really good points. And if you can find, I've always wanted to think like, okay, I wonder who was at the cult concert that right. I went to yeah. at the Orpheum way back in 1988. If, yeah. I, if you could have like a, uh, some type of a sensor where you were hovering over the building right. and you could see all the dots of color. <laughs> oh, yeah, there were yeah. people that you yeah, later you knew. Yeah, yeah. And, and you know, yeah. intertwined with in your life. And you just go, okay, that's why I got to be <laughs> friends with him yeah, or yeah. her because right. we did. And then maybe you find that you've done more and more things, it, you know, same. around the same people, around the same time. And yeah. I think, you know, when I was uh, living in Boston, uh, did a club night called X night at Axis on Lansdowne street. And it got very successful. 
yeah. because of, of just that. I think it was all the people that had been at all the right places right, at, right. at the same time yeah. now converged here weekly, and, yeah. and yeah. that's what made that successful. Yeah. But getting yeah. back to uh, to Maine, yeah, that just knowing the DJ yeah. was something that had uh, an amazing effect on yeah. me. I, I thought that that was just really yeah. cool, and, you know. And, yeah, and, the, and that must have prepared you for later on, like being around sort of celebrities and, and famous people? To a that. certain extent, but I, I don't know. Sometimes, you know, I'm a real stargazer. Yeah. I always have been. Yeah. And I love to talk to celebrities, but yeah, I, I get a little nervous and, and tense around yeah. them. Yeah. Sometimes, it depends if we're on the same keel. Right. One of the things that would help is if I could smoke a joint with them. Right. Then you know yeah, that yeah. you're in the same room sort of together. Right. 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 And, and it, that way you... You feel better. It's more conversational yeah, and yeah. probably more natural to a certain extent. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Now, do you remember uh, the first time you, you went on air? Yeah, that was WHSN uh, at Hussing College in Bangor, Maine. Yeah. That was their campus radio station. What time was your, your first slot? Yeah. It was about 1 o'clock in the afternoon. I did a, a 1 to 3. They gave me two hours. There was a yeah. sign that was hanging up on the station door that said, we'll let anybody on. <laughs> yeah. Because there was just not enough interest in the station. And right. I, I kind of felt like, oh, shit, they may can the station if right. you know somebody doesn't get involved. And if I like it, I'll tell a couple of my friends, maybe we'll all get into it because we all like music. Yeah. And I was there actually um, studying a culinary arts program. Okay. And the first time that I went on the air, I knew that the kitchen was now out of my right. life. This is what I wanted to do. Yeah. I don't want to sweat in a kitchen yeah. in July making, you know, pasta steaming right. over me yeah, yeah. and me sweating into the food because right. it's inevitable. No matter right. how you try to protect it, <laughs> yeah, there's exactly. stuff in your food, folks. It's just right. how it goes. But uh, I didn't want to do that. I wanted to do this because I, I did it naturally. Yeah. I sounded okay. I didn't sound great, right. but I knew what I was talking about enough to say a line or two about a band. I remember yeah. the first record that I ever played was Cheap Tricks, Dream Police. Oh, nice. And that was, uh, I think, yeah, that would have been 1980 yeah, yeah. <coughs> that yeah. I was playing that. That's my favorite song, by the way. Is it? As a side yeah. Yeah. I saw them uh, at the Augusta Civic Center oh, right. when they did the Budokan tour. Oh, all right, yeah. And that, it was pretty good i mean yeah. uh unfortunately somebody hit robin zander right between the eyes with a piece of glass they oh, flicked really? it and oh. it cut him and there was a drop of blood they stopped the show this is huh. like three songs in yeah. there was like a 20 minute gap of are they gonna come back are they right. not gonna come back and then a promoter came out and said right. like look he's he wants to come back and play <laughs> for you but you right. gotta cut the shit and that was around the time remember steven tyler had his uh, cornea blown out yeah, at yeah. the Spectrum in Philadelphia with yeah. an M80. Yeah. Like a, it blew up about an inch yeah, from his from eyes. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah, just, I mean, people that do things like that don't deserve <laughs> to be at those concerts. Yeah, yeah. You know, uh, it, it's not. Now we have to contend with shooters. Right. Yeah. So, you know, yeah. maybe the M80 wasn't so right. bad in, in, <laughs> in contrast yeah. to, you know, the Bataclan or whatever. Yeah, right. But yeah, so that so your first it was a um, on, uh, in the a weekday one one p.m. It, yeah, it was a a one p.m. shot, and I I did the two hours, and the guy that was on before me was the friend that said, "Look, I I think I can get you a slot on there if they're letting anybody on." Yeah, yeah. and uh, yeah, he actually fucked things up for oh, me yeah. because he lifted the needle off the wrong record. There were two uh, epic labels playing the black epic, like. Dream yeah. Police is on, yeah. and he lifted off the wrong one. The orange, he, orange but he did it with good intent. Yeah, he was just yeah. trying to help. But yeah. I, to my amazement, I knew to pot down the board, which means turn the board down, don't drop the needle back on so right. it goes right. on the air and yeah, yeah. everybody hears your complete right. fuck up and meltdown. Right. Turn it down and then drop the needle, then pot it back up to yeah. a decent level right. and, and just continue on as if nothing has happened. That's all yeah. you can really do. Yeah. I mean, there's there's kind of a, a rule of thumb with me in radio. I don't know if other DJs follow it, but kind of in for a penny, in for a pound. Yeah. If I cue up the wrong song back in the day when we were playing vinyl, <clears throat> I'm talking about if I cue up the wrong song, in for a penny, in for a pound, I'm going to let it play. Right. 
I'm not going to stop it in the middle right. of it and change it. That, it that's an offense and, uh, to the audience, I think. Right. Maybe there are people that are already grooving on that song. Right. And now right. you're going to turn that off and you're going right. to replace it with the one that they heard 18 times <laughs> yesterday. Right. No, you don't need to do that. It, yeah. It's co- a lot of common sense. Yeah. Uh, came into play back in the day with the radio. I don't think that the common sense comes in so much anymore with computers. I yeah. mean, it's going to do it for you automatically. Yeah. It yeah. takes the common sense element out of it. Yeah. The only thing left is for you to put your foot in your mouth right. when yeah. you do open the mic live. Yeah, I think the limited technology back then, you had to improvise and, and on the spot. So I think absolutely you, you had, had to, this, this, you know, especially you the CD skillful. players when they first came out. How yeah. unreliable they were, right. and they weren't really made for the abuse that a radio station would put one through. Right. Yeah. And we were only using like you know ninety nine dollar go get them right. at Best Buy yeah, yeah. at the time because yeah. if you paid seven eight hundred dollars a thousand dollars for these CD players, they broke as fast as the ninety nine dollar one. Yeah. So just go down and get a half dozen of them right. and keep them in the closet and, yeah. and pull them out as you needed them. Yeah. And, but now everything is um, completely different. You yeah. know, I, I mean, you, you just have to have your yeah. master computer, right. and your yeah. mainframe, and all of that. Yeah. So, uh, so you did you work your way up to the higher position there in the in the radio at that station? Uh, I became the music director at HSN. Okay. <clears throat> so that gave me an idea of what it was like to have the thrill of, first of all, seeing a package come in from RCA Records with yeah, your well, name on it yeah, now. And you're the one that's like, yeah. you know charged with opening it and yeah. deciding if this record is of value for the station yeah. because they're going to send you everything under the sun. Yeah. And whatever the big band is at the moment, you know that you're going to get 18 knockoff bands yeah, over the next three months coming yeah. I- you know in, in dribbles. Yeah. So the idea was to go through all of this, find the independent music that was good or worthy or not necessarily even the independent. Yeah. It's not that you don't trust the major label. It's just that the, the major label is there to make a lot of money because they have a lot of people to impress right. and to pay. Yeah. And they used to do things in a really big, big fashion. I yeah. mean, there was money to burn. Oh, yeah. At one point, uh, there was money to freeze. I went to a... Uh, a fix record release party and the word fix was written in ice in the middle (laughs) and this was at the Ritz Carlton in Boston and the word fix is giant like five foot you know high letters in ice so money to freeze (laughs) rather than to burn at that particular point but I mean you would see that and you go like okay I know who paid for that Johnny who went to the mall and had to pay $17 (laughs) for his fucking Tom Petty CD and that's at the time Tom Petty was like this is ridiculous why are we doing this to the the people that support us why can't we support them back and then you know REM got involved yeah. and Pearl Jam, and it's yeah. been a long successive line. Even Metallica, to a certain point, took a stand yeah. with uh, Napster, whether you agreed on, with it or not. I mean, it really was their music. Yeah, yeah. I know I don't want somebody coming in my house and going through my refrigerator and just making a sandwich <laughs> and going, "Well, it's a community sandwich, <laughs> right. right?" Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And so after. Uh, College. After college came uh, the big time where you have to uh, find a job in yeah. real radio. Yeah. And I moved to California thinking, okay, I've got all this experience, three years at this college radio station, yeah. mm-hmm. thinking, you know, oh, I'm amazing. <laughs> this is going to yeah. be great. Right. My friend, I landed in San Diego. I heard the first DJ on the air. I never stepped foot in a radio station when I was there. Yeah. I was so intimidated. Wow, yeah. Like, 20 years old, yeah. just a total young buck yeah, yeah. in San Diego listening to these guys, and they sound amazing. Yeah. Everybody sounded 35 perfect and with an amazing set of balls that right. gave them the best baritone voice right, ever, right. you know? Yeah, yeah. A real set of clackers. Yeah. And just, I became intimidated yeah. and said, I, I can't compete with this this yeah. is i didn't realize the difference in markets i didn't realize what was a large market what was a small market right so after a year i went my way back to maine and decided to go to a broadcasting school okay which was just starting up in bangor the uh, new england school of broadcasting yeah and i did really well there because I was in kind of a natural for it. I could read news without stumbling and stuttering. Right. I could pronounce words correctly. I could come up on the spot with six words that meant the same thing, right. you know, like in a, a thesaurus sort of way. Yeah. 
Uh, and that was good that, because that's beneficial. When you're trying to describe something, you can't keep going, well, that's amazing. That was an amazing <laughs> show. His guitar right. work was amazing. Yeah, yeah. Their clothing, oh, amazing. <laughs> you don't want to hear that anymore. Right. So, yeah, I went to the broadcasting school. I did very well, but I've always been kind of a hand biter yeah. guy where I don't know. I, I don't know if it's conditioned in me that I have to make an attempt to ruin something before <laughs> I can thoroughly enjoy it. But yeah. there's a pattern of that with me. But anyway, so, you know, right. here I am with a 3.9 average, but I'm lighting paper airplanes on fire and right. throwing them out the fourth floor window of the school over the busiest intersection in Bangor, <laughs> Maine. Yeah. And people are calling the cops and the right. cops are coming in and the uh, the president of the school is just shaking his head going right. like you're one of my best <laughs> and brightest students i know that you have a future right. why are you doing this yeah and i said i'm bored yeah i want to do the real thing i'm tired of cutting spec spots for the next professor i right. mean I'm, I'm just bored i know i can do it you know that i'm going to graduate right uh probably at, close to the top of your class yeah. and uh it just <laughs> kind of soured with him for a little while, yeah, yeah. especially we went on two trips to New York together yeah. to uh, tour media sites, ABC, NBC, CBS, oh, yeah. the Metropolitan Museum of Television, oh, nice. and uh, just all these different places yeah. that we went to. We got to see Howard Stern actually stood yeah. outside of his uh, glass booth at the time oh, wow. at NBC yeah. and saw him with Robin and I think Jackie Martling was in there with him at yeah. the time. And that was kind of cool. That was way bigger than seeing oh, yeah. Dutch Heiser. Yeah, yeah. And at least I knew who Howard was right. from Letterman. Yeah. I mean, I couldn't pick up New York radio, right. but... Yeah. I could watch Letterman, and yeah. I knew that Howard had been on there several times, and yeah. if he was on there, he had to be oh, yeah. something of, you yeah. know, of, a, of a force of nature. Yeah. We went to we were Stern fan? Um, yeah, I, yeah. I would, I would yeah. say so. Yeah. I, I, I mean, there was a time that it was a little goofy, and probably I had to get away from it, yeah. maybe right around the time that the, his terrestrial run was ending. Yeah, yeah. Then I think he took on a different persona. Once you're allowed to be uncensored, it right. doesn't mean yeah, that you want to say fun. fuck every right. five seconds. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Or you're going to drop C words or whatever. Right. Yeah. That's not what it what it's about. It yeah. just means that you have the relaxation yeah, yeah. to present yourself, yeah. the art, and the artist yeah. together in a, a fashion that is now realistic. Yeah. Yeah. Most recently for the show that I'm doing, I uh, there's been... Uh, a great new album from Ice Cube, who is yeah. very set against, you know, prosecuting Trump. Right. There's a song called Arrest the President. Yeah. There's a couple other tracks. And I found myself having to edit them out, the, yeah. you know, the, the fucks out of yeah. the song or turn them around or whatever. Right. I got so tired of doing it that <laughs> I stopped that show yeah. and I started something brand new. And we'll get to that, yeah. at, you know, at, through the course of our, our talk, because it seems like you're building up a little bit. Yeah, you yeah, want to yeah. follow a, a little chronology? <laughs> to, yeah, 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 that's fine. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's fine. Yeah. Um, so, but it's great to be able to do something like that now yeah. where I have the freedom without the, the censorship. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Because it was long, hard fought for yeah. and long, hard earned. Yeah, yeah, of course. After decades and decades. Yeah, definitely. So, yeah, so getting back to the school, I graduate, I get a job uh, as an intern at WTOS. Yeah. And slowly over the years, I, I progress my way up to a part-time position, to a full-time position, to the music director. Yeah. And I really enjoyed that station. It was a great station to kind of cut your teeth mm -hmm. with. It was the station where I first heard the Sex Pistols, the Ramones. I was the first one who got to play the Beastie Boys. Oh, nice. I was the first one who got to play Run DMC or anything like that on that station that yeah. was out of the norm. The yeah. cult uh, was very big. That um, album Electric oh, yeah. was huge for the station, as yeah. had Love been previously yeah, yeah. because of She Sells Sanctuary and yeah. Rain. I mean, that was a band that was really on a roll. They were definitely yeah. on a steam train that was headed for bigger success. Yeah. And I think Electric really kicked the door open for them for a lot of people yeah. because it had such a groove to it. Rick Rubin, one of my all-time favorite producers. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, to me, when he touches something, I become very interested, whether yeah. it's Johnny Cash, the Beastie Boys, yeah. the Cult, or whoever, Slayer, right. whoever, that yeah. he's... That he's yeah, in that era, everything he touched was 
and it, it wasn't that because he touched it, it automatically was gold. Right. It, because, yeah. it was because he knew what he was doing. Yeah, he knew what to do with and the And he bands. knew each individual band to find yeah. the internal workings of that band and yeah. bring it out in the music and the production. Yeah. That's why that album, Electric, is so different than yeah. any other cult album. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's got a funk to yeah, it that yeah. is not on any no, other no, definitely. cult album. Yeah. And, you know, I love songs like Sweet Soul Sister and, yeah. and Fire Woman and Eddie yeah. Chow Baby, but they don't have that no. funk to it yeah. like Peace Dog does yeah. Yeah. or Memphis Hip Shake. Yeah. I mean, those, those are just phenomenal yeah. things. So to get to play that in Maine yeah. and to have the uh, ability to say, here's another new track from that cult album yeah, and not yeah. have to play just Love Removal Love Machine, Machine right. over and over and yeah. over, which is great. We were the only ones, I think, in the state playing it. Yeah. BLM at the time um, wasn't... Um, I mean, they they are pretty much what they are now. BLM is a historic station, a legendary station out of uh, Portland. Yeah. But they're, to, to quote the program director, they're like a can of Budweiser. Yeah. You open it, it's consistent. Yeah. REO Speedwagon, Skinnerd. Right. Billy Squire, Boston, Boston. Yeah. you know, all, all great music, but yeah. it's the 1,500 songs right. that you know. Yeah. And rarely do they deviate. So yeah. that was what we were building our philosophy on. Plus, they were at the bottom of the state. We're right. in the middle of the state broadcasting more northern more north, yeah. than southern. Yeah. And it became just a great joy to have people call and yeah. say, oh my God, thank you for playing yeah. this music yeah. and not playing this, you know, um, Mandy by Barry Manilow again right. for the umpteenth time or yeah. putting on some elevator music yeah. or some type of just, you know, nonsense music that, that dribbled, that, yeah. that just drives you nuts. Right. You know, you hear it in places, uh, mostly in the drugstore. Yeah, yeah. You know, that's where you'll hear a song. And unfortunately, because those songs, whether you like them or not, they're right. encrypted into your brain. Oh, of course, yeah. You want to tell me you can't sing 500 Miles with the <laughs> Proclaimers when it comes on? And I will I walk 500 miles. Yep. And I heard it in, you know, that's, to me that's a drugstore song. As yeah. much as I like that song, right. uh, and I like the Proclaimers, they were a, a, a good little duo of brothers. But, you know, when you hear that song, I, I only hear it either in relation to... Uh, some drug that they're selling on right. television, yeah. or in the drugstore. Right. So that, that's that's like drugstore radio to me. <laughs> Do you love going in Walmart and listening yeah. to Walmart radio? <laughs> oh, isn't that great? Yeah, yeah. I just love great. Walmart radio <laughs> when they play War Pigs <laughs> yeah. or um, Fuck Forever by Baby Shambles. Yeah, yeah. It's, oh, oh man, yeah. I could just stand there <laughs> and look at the tuna cans and try to figure right. out what has dolphin and doesn't, <laughs> you know, because I've got the time with the music <laughs> overhead. Yeah, yeah. It's just beautiful. <laughs> Oh, man. But that, you know, Walmart radio isn't that far from regular radio yeah. today. Yeah, yeah. We were just talking before we started recording how Boston just lost its only alternative station. Yeah. Again, yeah. BOS now gone and has become a Another classic rock friend. station. Which, how are you going to challenge ZLX right. in that market? ZLX yeah. is a cornerstone of radio in yeah. Boston now. Yeah. BCN gone, FNX gone. Uh, AAF is still doing its TNA thing, but on yeah. the outskirts of everything, yeah. it's not yeah. really a Boston radio station right. as much as it would like to be, yeah. and probably could be. But it's still, you know, people it's think of it, it more as a Worcester station. Yeah, yeah. So it's really tough to see what's happened to radio since I've been there from the beginning, chipping yeah. away here yeah. and there, trying to give people any type of a musical education yeah. that I could. Those. The, deemed me worthy enough to listen to, which yeah. I always appreciated. Yeah. yeah. I'll never understand because everybody right. probably yeah. has their own, you know, self esteem issues. But yeah. it's for somebody to say like, oh, I listen to him because he I know that he's going to play something consistent. Right. He's going to show me the best new music. He's going to play me interviews from people that I want to know about. Yeah. I want to know more than just the music. Yeah. I remember right. getting to hear my first interview with Patty Smith. Yeah. Uh, on WTOS they played a, a brief bit on uh, a syndicated radio show that they had yeah and that to me was just phenomenal yeah and to answer a part of your question from earlier on it was also magazines yeah at that time cream circus, circus. hit parader yeah um rock scene trouser press oh that trouser Pre earlier, well yeah. yeah trouser press that was hard to find in Skowhegan, yeah. maine though but yeah, i could get yeah. i could get all the others i could get the american yeah. rock magazines yeah um, and Emmy, no, yeah, you yeah. couldn't get anything like that yeah. or Q or anything. Right. But to, you know, I had this weird thing. 
trying to figure out how I'm going to get all of this music, all these magazines, all these yeah. T-shirts on this lousy allowance that I had. <laughs> yeah. And growing up five miles out of town right. without a car, yeah. there, there wasn't even a Coke machine right. for five miles. Yeah. So there... I grew up on the three channels that we had in the house and what my parents had in the cupboards in the fridge. There was yeah. no bartering. I right. didn't get to go and say, all right, you know, let's get a bottle of Coke right. this week. Yeah, no, yeah. no, no, no. We, don't. we get half and half because yeah. we, uh, we drink it with our whiskey. So yeah. if no you don't, Amazon. I mean, yeah, and, no, right, and nothing to deliver anything at <laughs> right. that time. I mean, yeah. you couldn't even get a food delivery. Right. There wasn't even cable yeah. at that point. Yeah. And when there was... It was 12 years before cable yeah. got to my parents' house five well, miles it, yeah. outside of the, Where you were, the town. Yeah. <laughs> I remember once I rode my bike to town, my, and I passed my father. Yeah. And he shit his pants. What is my kid doing on this road? <laughs> because it's log trucks left and right because yeah. the Scott paper mill was where I uh, was, grew up. It was right down the road about a mile. Yeah. And yeah, it probably, come to think of it, you didn't see a lot of bicyclists on that road, Route yeah, 201, course. going yeah. right through Maine. Uh, because of that, yeah, and you lost a lot of pets, and uh, you know <laughs> the pet cemetery thing probably <laughs> happened more than we yeah, actually yeah. would like to say here yeah, in I Maine. But that's literally what I was just thinking when you. Said that's that. why we delude ourselves with whoopee pies. <laughs> so after, uh, wh- when did you end up moving to Massachusetts? Well, the gentleman came in and bought WTOS, changed the format, and we held a public funeral for it. Yeah, and I quit. Yeah. Uh, I stood up actually in the meeting when he was saying, yes, we're going to keep it a rock station, but you're not going to be playing this Echo in the Bunnymen and Cure anymore. Right. You'll be replacing it with Bon Jovi, right. Twisted Sister, yeah. whatever's big next week, right. whatever the charts dictate. Yeah. So I, I, when he said that, I mean, I had put so much blood, sweat, and tears into that station along with many others right. yeah. that... There was a loud buzzing in my head. I, yeah. I literally was tuning him out, and yeah. I, I I couldn't hear what he was saying anymore, and I didn't right. want to hear yeah. what he was saying anymore. So I stood up, and I said, I can't do this. Yeah. And I kind of just quit. And in my head, I floated like out of the room, <laughs> you know, almost, right. because everything is being taken away from me in an instant. Yeah. Tomorrow is not going to be what yesterday right. was suddenly, and today sucks. Yeah. yeah. So, ooh, yeah. Yeah, the importance of like a music director to a radio station in that era, I think. Correct, is, and he wasn't even going to have a music director right. because he had all of the songs prepared, they pre-picked. and they probably were going to s- go to um, some type of a um, satellite system right. after 7 p.m., yeah. which is what a lot of stations do now. Right. It was starting back then. This is when you know, consultants came into radio, and that's what really killed radio. Yeah. I firmly believe that. Yeah. There was a, a famous pair. I don't even want to say their name. They were the ones that, that started it all. Yeah. And they, they got these major market stations to do it. And then the minor market stations started to follow in suit yeah. because it worked there yeah. for them. Right. Well, it worked because it was new and different at the time. But just because you're in Tallahassee, right. you can't tell me what's going to happen in Skowhegan, Maine, right. what people want to hear, what yeah. the variables are between right. your logistics and mine. Yeah. Come on. No, right. you can't do it. Yeah. You can give me a few ideas right. and say, work these in, and maybe I'll negotiate with right. you. But you can't come along full-fisted and slam it down on the right. table along with the list and go, this is it. Right. This is all there is to it. And it's like a guy from New York. You know, yeah. Yeah. Like, not, yeah. You, you just don't want to play that ball because if you do that, you're going to feel like you're selling out. You're going right. to feel that the audience is, is going to think that you're selling out. Yeah. And some people can sell out with no issues. Some people get into certain jobs and positions to make money. Yeah. Radio, to me, it, making money in radio was always a fluke. Right. If you watched Howard Stern's Private Parts movie, he never thought he was going to yeah. climb that chain and right. be making $15, $20 million right. a year. Yeah. He expected a $350 a week paycheck, yeah. probably with um, a, you know, a ratio of... Uh, more money over time, yeah, of course, but not to the extent. Yeah, and I mean that's just a fluke. The people that get that type yeah. of thing, yeah, even the largest market morning men don't make all that much money. Yeah. I mean, a couple hundred thousand dollars, yeah. but the station is making millions and millions in revenue. Yeah, yeah. So there was always kind of a an unfairness thing to it. But I mean, I I worked for six bucks an hour in yeah. Maine. 
Um, actually, less. I worked for six bucks an hour when I finally got to FNX, which yeah. would have been 1987. Yeah, okay. So 82 to 87 at TOS in Maine, yeah. and then 87 to around 92 in Boston. Yeah. When, and I remember driving down for the interview mm-hmm. uh, with Michael Bright at uh, WFNX in Lynn, Mass., which yeah. is where the station was, and you know Lynn yeah. all so well. Yes. And... I'm driving down and I'm picking them up and I'm hearing Go um, by Tones on Tail oh, yeah. and Attack Ships on Fire from the Revolting Cox. And it's 1130 in the morning. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I'm, you know, I'm I'm on 95. I'm beeping right. my horn and cheering right. and slamming the thing going <laughs> like, this is going to be my future. This is amazing. Yeah. And so I got there and I got the job and started overnights in the scariest possible location <laughs> that you could really have one in. It was like the 10th circle of hell in Dante's. Yeah, yeah that era too, in the yeah. 80s and, and Lynn was... It was brutal because there was as many people on the sidewalk at 4 in the morning as there was at 4 in the afternoon. Yeah. And if you pulled up any time after dark, you immediately were propositioned with, <laughs> do you want, what do you want, what do you right. need, who A can I get job, for you? Drugs, yeah, right. yeah what, whatever it was. And uh, wow, there were, there were times that and there was no way to get into the station. You had to go across the street to the payphone. Yeah. Because you were literally the low man on the totem pole. So you went to the payphone, yeah. called the DJ that was on on the special line, the bat line, yeah. that has a blinking strobe light to get your attention. Yeah. And then you'd say, hey, I'm downstairs. Well, you had to wait till they did their next segue and put yeah. on a long enough song to run down three flights of stairs yeah. and let you in. And then they had to get back up. Yeah. And I mean, it was just crazy. Yeah. I was so happy the day they gave me a key when I became <laughs> an official employee and I right. could actually put a key in. Yeah. But it, it was rough there. I mean, we saw blood. There yeah. was no doubt that there was bloodshed. There was a guy that got hit in the head yeah. by people that were breaking into his car. Yeah. And they brought him back into the station. This is one o'clock in the morning. I had just smoked a joint. And the place is reeking a pot. And this kid's trying to hold a flap of skin on the side of his right. head. Together, yeah. his blonde hair is now crimson red. There's yeah. blood all over the floor, on the wall, on the <laughs> steps. I mean, he was he was gashed yeah. pretty good with a a rock the size of a softball from about ten feet. Yeah, and so now the cops come. Yeah, and the place reeks a pot, <laughs> and I'm freaking out. Like, yeah. oh, this is it. My whole radio career is done. <laughs> I'm going down right yeah. now, hook, line, and sinker. How long? How long you know, into being there was was this? You think? What's that? How long into working at FNX was this? Uh, that would have been, well, that was in the, the second studio, so that would have been about halfway through, yeah, probably yeah. about two and a half years. Okay, yeah. I was doing the, an overnight show at that point, yeah. five nights a week, yeah. called um, Radio Free Boston. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, so, uh, you know, the guy's bleeding, and the cops are, are there, and nobody says a word about the pot. <sighs> they just do their whole thing medically. They yeah. take a statement. They put him in the ambulance, and 10 minutes later, I'm there all alone. Yeah. And there's blood everywhere. Right. And I, I'm going like, oh, my God, it's like 1.20 a.m. I've got to go till 6 a.m. by myself. So I did the only thing I could think to do would put on some public enemy yeah. and light another joint. Yeah. What, what are you going to do after that? Right. I mean, yeah. I'd look out the window and the guy's, you know, his car is still there with the right. blood trail and the broken glass. Yeah. And I'm just like, Jesus, that's what I get to look at all night. <laughs> Welcome to Monday. Yeah, I know. <laughs> So besides that, I mean, it, it was a good station to work for. Yeah. It really was. A, uh, it was a great station, yeah. even better than TOS because it had a niche that it knew what it wanted. TOS was a, a wonderful station, yeah. but the morning guy was still playing uh, Kansas and Toto, and right. I'm at the nighttime playing Ramones and the Sex Pistols, so right. there, there always was a weird dichotomy. Yeah. And then in the middle, the guy was playing the Grateful Dead and Bob Marley right. in middays. So it did transist during the day yeah. to a, a, a wind-up. Yeah, yeah. But at, uh, at T, I'm, I'm sorry, at FNX, there was always uh, a designated destination where we were headed yeah. with that particular station. Yeah. Because the Boston Phoenix was so liberal a newspaper and it was yeah. the owner of WFNX, hence the FNX, as in Phoenix. Yeah. And um, that was just a wonderful experience. I mean, everybody was on the same page. Yeah. Everybody wanted, you know, the same bands played. Right. Where REM had become a house band in Maine, they were just another band amongst all the great bands yeah, being yeah. played yeah, by FNX. They didn't yeah. really 
stick out in such a way that they did in Maine, but yet yeah. they were even more popular in oh, Boston yeah. than, they, than they were in Maine. Yeah, and, and the personalities of all the uh, DJs at FNX uh, is what stuck, you know, stuck out for me, too, which... We were allowed to say and play and do just about anything within yeah. reason. Yeah, I yeah. mean, you kind of had to call yourself on the carpet yeah. so the station didn't have to. Yeah. If you could achieve that, then you were spot on yeah. and play the music. I mean, the morning guy, Ty, yeah. probably the most uh, successful and beloved DJ that FNX ever produced. Yeah. And Julie Kramer being the second one, who yeah. she's gone on with Indy Six One Seven and has yeah. had uh, good support there and a, a great turnout for her artwork that she's been yeah. uh, selling yeah, finally. Fun. Because Julie at FNX, not only was she um, a DJ, but she was the staff photographer, yeah. not for the Phoenix, because yeah. they didn't really print too many of her pictures right. in the Phoenix. It was more <clears throat> for the uh, analogs of the station. Yeah. Just sort of and to, yeah, just capture to, to the moment, capture the moment and yeah. make sure that <clears throat> that we all um, got a picture with Johnny Rotten yeah. when he came around, or Those with Lou awesome Reed, or, or or whoever. I mean, yeah. that was the the thing between the difference between Maine and Boston. Right. Now, real rock stars are coming to where I work. Yeah, I don't have to go search them out anymore. Right. I don't have to meet them in a motel. I don't have yeah. to drive 200 miles to interview somebody. Right. No, Johnny Rotten is going to come <laughs> on Tuesday at 3 o'clock. Right. And when you realize that, you're, you know, you're so happy and everything. But I tell you, Tuesday at 2.30, you're shitting your pants because yeah. yeah. you don't know what's going to happen. Yeah. This is Johnny Rotten coming. This is a guy that you know blew snot at Tom <laughs> Snyder or, right. or, or yeah. Bill Grundy or whoever, or, yeah. you know, whichever right. interview that you've seen where he went off. Yeah. And you're wondering, like, what's it going to be like? Is he going to be on our side? Right. Is he going to play fair? Are we going to yeah. say something that angers him? Because you don't know. <laughs> what are you going to say to a guy whose last name is Rotten? Right. And who has done all of these things. Yeah. And, and you know, remember yeah. when Punk was about spitting on him? Right. And he really hated that. Yeah, yeah. He was, I, I saw the new Punk series on Epics. Have you, oh, have yeah. you watched that? I have, yeah. He was like, basically, he was like, fuck you for spitting <laughs> on me. And if I can get my hands around your throat, yeah. I will. Yeah, yeah. That's not, you know, <laughs> punk is not about spreading your diseases right. to know. me via your sputum. Yeah. Did you remember the, the first sort of famous person you met while at, uh, you know, doing radio? Uh, the first famous person? Yeah, that would be Stephen King. Yeah? Okay. I saw him, at, uh, this was when I was doing the HSN show uh, at Husson College, yeah. I went to see Beatlemania at the Bangor Auditorium, and he mm -hmm. sat behind me. Oh, right. And I have a cousin who was his dentist out of Portland when yeah. he was writing Carrie. Oh, wow. So my cousin had a first edition Carrie autograph to him yeah. in his library, and I always thought as a child <laughs> that that was just, you know, fucking fantastic. Oh, yeah. That, like, blew my mind. This is Stephen King's signature. Yeah. You knew him? What yeah. was he like? What did he say? <laughs> like, what, what does right. he wear? And yeah. and my cousin's like, I, you know, whatever. Right. He, it was a, a guy in the drill chair, and I'm <laughs> doing his teeth, and, right. you know, rinse and spit. And so... I asked Stephen King, would you like to come on my radio show? I know that it's just a tiny 11 watt right. thing. It doesn't mean anything. Yeah. And he said, yes. Oh, wow. And he said, my wife will call you. Yeah. Give me your number. My wife, Tabitha, will call you and you can come by the house and we'll talk about it. Yeah. And I was like, okay. <laughs> so I'm with my friend, um, Mike. And we go, we get the call and we're going to the house and like idiots, you know, we puff a big fatty. We, right. Like we weren't thinking like right. we're going to reek up the guy's house. Right. And, you know, we're just, it was really immature. Right. I, th I think I was 20. Mike yeah. was 20. Right. We were just not really clued in yet yeah. as to how to present yourself yeah, to yeah. somebody of notability. Yeah, yeah. Who has invited you into his home? <laughs> yeah, exactly. And you don't really get that because his house is this amazing mansion with yeah. this spider web, uh, wrought iron gate yeah, out yeah. front, and it's just amazing. And I had another friend in broadcasting school whose grandfather was 
uh, Stephen King's caretaker okay. and was charged with going into the room to clean up after Stephen. Stephen would write in the attic. This yeah. is what I was told. I, right. yeah. I don't know, yeah. you know, 100%. Right, right. But I was told that he wrote in the attic at a small schoolboy's desk with an old typewriter yeah. and that at points the grandfather had gone in and had to remove shards of metal, broken glass, animal fur, strange things out of this typewriter right. at the end of the day and clean the room up to a certain extent that yeah. King wanted it presentable, restock the paper, make sure the ribbon is good. He had to do right. all that. So yeah. King literally just came in and sat down and, and did his uh, genius work. Huh. So we, we go to the house and we walk in and Stephen King is watching dailies yeah. from... Um, What's the dead movie? The one, that, the dead zone. The dead zone, right? Yeah. With Christopher Walken. Yeah, yeah. This movie had not been released, and he yeah. had just done some work on The Shining, yeah. but was not given that much say in The Shining. Yeah. Uh, remember that was Stanley Kubrick? Kubrick. Sort of, yeah, yeah, he took it and ran with yeah, his idea, yeah. and King wasn't too happy with yeah. that, yeah. and said in several interviews that I wouldn't have done it that right. way. Right. Yeah. So he's watching, you know, Christopher Walken, and I can see that it's a daily because it's like the same scene six times, right. but slightly different. And yeah. he's, he's watching these, and so I ask him, you know, what is your input on these movies? Yeah. Well, that was the wrong thing to ask. Yeah. You just don't know. Yeah. Now we're back in Johnny Rotten Land. Right. Am, am I going to ask the wrong thing? Right. And how do you even know what is the wrong thing right, right. when you're an inquisitive kid who's fucking yeah, stoned? Yeah, yeah. And Stephen King is here. I can ask you to go, hey, Beavis, yeah, hey, <laughs> right. butthead. Yeah. That's probably what he thought. Yeah, yeah. You know, and he stiffened up yeah. and stood up and looked at me and, and said, it's time for you guys to go. Oh, I mean, we'd been there five minutes. Yeah, yeah. It's time for you guys to go. And we yeah. were like, well, are you, you you're not going to yeah. do the show? Or I said, it's time for you to go. Yeah. And I swear, Christian, on yeah. my parents' grave, <laughs> he walked out of the room and walked back into the room with a butcher knife. Yeah. <laughs> and stood in the doorway that we had to walk out <laughs> yeah. with the knife in his hand yeah. as his wife tisk tisked us all the way to the door. <laughs> Tisk, tisk, tisk. <laughs> you had your chance. You had your chance. We didn't even know that right. we had our chance or right, what right. our chance was. I, mean, huh. it was. I thought it was going to somebody's house. Like, right. you always go to visit somebody, but yet you knew that it was right. Stephen King. But yeah. you still have that, well, we're not going to be out in the open. <laughs> we can be normal. Right. Yeah. I, I thought I was asking a normal question, but apparently it was too much yeah. for him. Oh, okay. But I did see later in a Playboy interview that he said, I'm supposed to be on a radio show in Bangor at some point. So he must oh, have really? done oh, that Playboy interview in between the time, yeah. like over a couple of days. Right. And I remember reading that in the because there was 20 questions with, with yeah. Stephen King. Yeah. And I remember him saying that in there, and I was so taken aback yeah, that, yeah. <laughs> that, like, I might, I'm, I would assume that he was talking about me. Right, yeah. So I somehow anonymously got referenced in Playboy. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Nothing wrong with that. <laughs> Perfect. So, so FMX had this great, you know, family feel yeah. to it to, for the people that worked there. Yeah. You know, the Phoenix took care of us. They gave us, you know, we always had jackets yeah. and ski outfits and, yeah. uh, you know, anything that, that would promote the station. Yeah. They gave yeah. us a nice van. But they chose a campaign with ad, an ad campaign that had colors neon pink and neon lime. Oh, yeah. Oh, and it looked yeah. bad on a black van. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it stuck out. You saw right. it coming, and yeah. on the billboards that they did on uh, going into Boston. Yeah. Oh, they they just yeah, it was that. horrible. Yeah, it was horrible. And then they took one, yeah. and they gave it to us, and we put it up on the a whole billboard side. Yeah. On the wall, and that's what we stood in front of. It's these pink yeah, F N X yeah. pictures. Every picture that yeah. I have that Julie took. Yeah. For it's a decade or better side, is yeah. in front. of it. Fucking pink thing. Yeah, yeah. You know, it's like, oh, hey, here I am with Mick Jones. Pink right. thing. Hey, here I am with Iggy Pop. Same pink thing. Right. The only thing is a different clothes. Yeah. But, I mean, there could have been worse things, you yeah. know. Did, did you uh, have, you know, you must have always had some great experiences with some of these artists. Do you have memories of people you really Absolutely, yeah. When, when I finally got to do the Radio Free Boston show in the overnight, um, I was really impressed with how many people 
bands, yeah. singers, comedians were willing to come up at 1 a.m. Yeah. in Lynn Mass. Now, if you'd have shown them yeah. through like a doorbell cam yeah. what 25 Exchange Street <laughs> looked like <laughs> at the hour that they yeah. were going to come yeah. into it, they might have, you know, reconsidered. But for the most part, I mean, Sonic Youth. Yeah. Mike Ness of Social Distortion, yeah. <clears throat> Anthrax, a couple members you, of Anthrax. I remember you, and I think you invited my brother and I to come up when Anthrax was there, and we, I don't think my mother would let me oh. that late or something. Yeah, I remember your brother Jeff was there uh, for the first birthday party where Bullet LaVolta played live yeah. Yeah. in the lobby. Yeah. Uh, th- that was amazing. Yeah. I mean, FNX was a, was a dive of a station. It was yeah. 25 Exchange Street in Lynn. Yeah. It was this old building that, had, w- that was once a bank. Yeah. So we were on the second floor, and our prize vault literally was, was a, a bank vault, vault yeah. that had a hand crank, you know, <laughs> like, I mean, you had, like you know, it was like steering a boat. Yeah. And there was wood paneling. Yeah. There was shitty carpet that had holes in it. Right. The paneling had holes in it, electric wires exposed coming out of the ceiling <laughs> where the, it was those bad drop ceiling yeah. tiles, so they stained every yeah. other one. Yeah, yeah. And that nasty neon light through oh, the plastic yeah. that yep. just sucked the vitamin D yeah. right out of yeah, you. Yeah. And, and a bunch of slashed up furniture, thanks to the replacements. Yeah. They had come in and cut the couch up. Uh, Tommy Stinson did with a, a switchblade. Oh, nice. And I don't know why they did that, but they right. did that like the week before I got there. So yeah. this is what I walk into. <laughs> the nicest thing that I see is a 10,000 Maniacs poster. Right. You know, at least I go, well, I'm home. You know, ten, right. someone likes 10,000 Maniacs here. Uh, and then over the years, it got better. I mean, we got better equipment. They finally, they gave us a nice production studio. And then they gave us a very nice studio uh, to broadcast out of. Because yeah. when I first got in there, it was very Tight. The the studio at the time was in the back of the station. Yeah. There was no windows in it looking directly outside, only into the building. Yeah. It was very tiny. There was one extra mic, not yeah. even two extra mics. So if you had, if REM came in, you got four guys fighting for a yeah. mic. So every interview sounded like shit except for the one guy that was sitting in front of the mic. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and it was tiny, like and tight, like a like a hot tub. Yeah. You know, like you were constantly rubbing up against somebody <laughs> else, or yeah. something. Right. And was, the transmitter was right in there that was going out to the tower. Yeah. It was in the same room, which you really shouldn't have that yeah. because of the heat factor. Yeah. And uh, there was just so many records, so many CDs, yeah. and it, in a tiny room that really was no bigger than a normal bathroom. Yeah, yeah. That was about the size of, of what it was. And the <laughs> yeah. bathrooms at FNX were cattle stalls yeah. that were one long, you know, one toilet at the end, and it was just this long <laughs> thing with a mirror on the right. side. Yeah. And you stepped up to go to the john. Oh, yeah. And the doors would close, and they would latch, and the latch would stick, and you couldn't get the door open to get out. So you'd think you were Michael Stipe of REM, missing for 30 <laughs> minutes, locked in the bathroom. How do you miss Michael Stipe for 30 right. minutes, locked in the bathroom. <laughs> I remember coming out one morning. Uh, I had gone over for breakfast at the Capitol Diner, which yeah. is a great diner right yeah. next to the station. I mean, everybody who ever worked at FNX or went to FNX for anything most likely wound up eating yeah. at the Capitol Diner. Yep. Chili Peppers ate yeah. there, yeah. a bunch of other people. I think there's a, a photograph of them. Oh, the, yeah. yeah. And I mean, the food was phenomenal. Yeah. Buddy yeah. would just give it to you. Until you couldn't eat anymore. Yeah. Nobody ever left the Capitol <laughs> Diner in Lynn Mass hungry. Yeah, that's yeah. for sure. And then they had the chickens in the front yeah, yard. The front, yeah, so yeah. they had you know the fresh eggs, <laughs> yeah, and yeah. it was just it yeah. was great. It was it was a little piece of local yokel in, in the crack of infested downtown Lynn, downtown Lynn. Yeah. exactly. And it, and it was all painted up nice like a barn, and yeah. it was just really cool. Yeah. I always appreciated that. I had a lot of great breakfasts there and yeah. lunches, but um, so. I would go over there and eat, and then I came back once around 7 a.m., and Ty was on the air, and a band called Heretics yeah. were in there, and they had a, um album out under a different name, yeah. Sand Dollar Treetops. Okay. So they were appearing as the Sand Dollar Treetops, even though it was Heretics. And I go into the bathroom, and I come out, and there's a naked woman in the woman's room, and her John is in there, and there's an empty half gallon of vodka. <laughs> And there is no clothes for her. So right. somehow they got into the station, 
she t- took her clothes. I mean, she got in naked. Right. They had to come in the front door where yeah. everybody else does, and they went up those granite steps, yeah. three flights, and got into our bathroom. <laughs> and she was servicing her John, and they were drinking, and like it was, it was just insane. And that was seven a.m. And then there was the time that uh, a guy killed himself at the station. Really? Yes, on a long weekend. He hmm. jumped, uh, the coroner said he probably jumped around midnight Friday night, landed on top of the elevator, went all the way down the, the, oh, three, I I remember that. the three floors, yeah. uh, and then you know, slammed into it and rode up and down on the elevator until Tuesday morning because it was yeah. a long weekend. Right. Ty found him at like 6 a.m., right. happened to look down and saw a guy on top of the elevator. And it was just, yeah, I mean, so the place was always haunted. Yeah. You know, even TOS in Maine was haunted. A guy on a motorcycle was decapitated by a tractor trailer right in front of the station while the doors were propped open. And we swear that his soul just came right in there. I mean, it was right directly out front. Huh. And it was, it was horrifying. I wasn't there. I, that was before my time, but the people that I've talked about with, regards to that yeah. said that it was really hor- horrible just huh. horrifying e- uh, so yeah then you had the, the guy haunting FNX after that and yeah. by the time we got into the new studio and I was doing the overnight show you could feel him yeah times I, huh. I wrote a book called Hang the DJ yeah. and in it, it you know it, there's a lot of uh, TOS stories and a lot of FNX stories but the cover is a painting that a listener did by the name of Alex Arcadia and I used to talk about these flying gray space slugs that would be on the walls of the, stu- uh, of the studio, of the yeah. station, while I was on the air. At yeah. roughly between 3 and 4 a.m. it would happen. Yeah. Now, there was one window looking to the outside, yeah. but that window was always closed and the shade was pulled. So there's right. no lights coming through, and lights yeah. don't come through in dark right. gray. Yeah, yeah. And the things would, would start on the wall, and then they would go over my head, and then they would go down the wall and they would disappear behind me. Yeah. It happened several times while friends were there. Yeah. So they witnessed it. Yeah. Uh, and so I would call them the flying space slugs. And Alex painted <laughs> a portrait of like this um, ubiquitous DJ yeah. who looks like Tommy who's holding yeah. these cruci- crucifix microphones right. and working the turntables yeah. uh, with the space slugs yeah. behind me in the air. And so he gave me that painting, and that actually is the cover of, of the Hang book, the DJ yeah. huh. that, uh, that's available. Yeah. You said you read it. I have, yeah. Uh, yeah. Did you get a, any laughs out of it? I mean, that was, <laughs> I did, I, that, yeah, the, that was my intent, was yeah. to make people laugh. Yeah, yeah. I think any show that I do, whether it's recorded or, or written in a, yeah. in a book form, yeah. uh, I want the element of comedy there. Yeah. I want mockery yeah, because yeah. It's, it's beautiful. Mockery yeah. is a beautiful thing. Yeah. You know, Trump deserves to be mocked. <laughs> yeah, and the show that I do now, there's a lot of, yeah, yeah. of mockery for him yeah. on American Debauchery, which yeah. is the latest show that, that I'm doing. Yeah. But uh, yeah. Hang the DJ has a lot of laughs. I mean, the story about the elephant in Maine where yeah. I'm riding the elephant and he slams his trunk into the trunk of my car <laughs> and dents it. And I'm, I'm like, how does that happen? <laughs> you know, and I'm on the air broadcasting live right. as it happens. And I'm riding on the elephant <laughs> that picks my car out of the parking lot and slams the trunk of the elephant onto the trunk of my poor car. <laughs> now, when, when you wrote the, the, this book, uh, there's some not controversial stuff in there, but there's stories in there. Have, has people gotten upset or anything about any? Like, there was. Any, funny yeah. that you should say that. Most people, I did make a, a mistake in yeah. the first printing I said that somebody who had, had been fired yeah. who was not fired okay. they, they left yeah. so when they contacted me and, and they weren't angry right, not right. at all yeah. not at all I said I'm sorry that's the way that I had remembered it and, right. and you know then he re-enlightened me and I changed it and everything yeah. but there was a, another person uh, basically due to, due to drug use in the book Yeah, felt like um, you should have asked me first Yeah, and I didn't want to ask a lot of people. I just wanted to tell the truth the way that it happened. Most of the drug use in the book is marijuana. Right. Uh, Anything else that is harder than marijuana, I'm doing on my own, by myself, without really anybody else. Right, yeah. So, um, but that person felt that I probably should have run that by, and uh, yeah, yeah, they... 
not too happy with me, but <laughs> that's okay. You yeah. know, to each yeah. their own. <clears throat> then when they get to write their book, then they can write the things that I did that I left yeah, out. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so what? So what was the process like put, putting the book together? Well, it started out like as a you know this huge thought. Yeah, I always wanted to do it. I told enough of my friends, enough of the stories, and so many of them said, you know, you should really put this in a book. Yeah. And I thought, well, how am I going to, you know, do this like anybody would? Because it's a daunting task to, to write a book. Yeah. So, and I had to get permission from Julie to use the photographs. I had to right. do the cover with Alex, get his permission. Leo yeah. Gosbeckian took a lot of photos of me. He's a famous photographer out of Boston. Yeah. Um, so I had to get all of their permission, and then I had to start to write it. Uh, I figured the best way to do it is go back to school. Yeah. So I went back to college. I took some writing courses oh, and refreshed myself on the proper way to do it, even though there's a ton of typos in, right. in the book. Yeah. Um, and, w you know, it's a DIY project. I did yeah. it through Lulu.com. Yeah. And so it's not, you know, like they're printing process and the way that they format stuff is not 100% perfect. Right. So yeah. there's a typesetting issue here and there right. in the book and, and then the typos. But I mean, for a low-budget book, it came out pretty well. Yeah. 400 plus pages, yeah. at least three dozen photographs, uh, some great stories about yeah. you know what it was like to meet someone like Kurt Cobain. Yeah. Uh, and I know, let's talk about that because you yeah. and I share that same show. Yeah, we yeah. were at Nirvana yeah. at Man Ray yeah. in Cambridge. What year? That was... 88 or 89. Eight, that 88. was one of the things I was going to actually ask you. Let, let's talk about Nirvana because they were a pretty important band for you and, and FNX yes. in, in breaking them. You know, So let's... Do you remember the first time you... you heard them and first time I heard them uh, this is a kind of a, a funny story it was Ian Clark yeah. who was Audrey's I think yeah son. Audrey Clark's son from the 360s who was yeah. living with Kurt St. Thomas at the time yeah. who was the music director uh, of FNX right so Ian had a skateboard tape and it had love buzz oh, yeah. from bleach mm -hmm. on it and at the end, it just said, you know, Nirvana. It didn't say anything about Sub Pop or anything right. like that. Yeah. Now, in comes your brother into the equation. I yeah. contact your brother who says, oh, yeah, I can get that record. That's Bleach from on Sub Pop yeah. from Nirvana. And he got it, you know, he was on uh, Rocket Records yeah. out on Route 1 in Saugus yeah. at the time. And so your brother was very influential, actually, in the getting us a lot of music yeah. that we needed through Rocket Records, through yeah. imports. I was amazed. I would call, uh, you know, Warner Brothers and ask for the 12-inch import from the new Jesus and Mary Shane and cut, they and they couldn't get it. And right. Jeff would have it for me the next day, and I'd yeah. be playing it that night. <laughs> and, th and that was amazing, and we, we wholeheartedly appreciated that, along with Jack at uh, the Record, record Connection. Yeah. Or record Exchange, sorry. Yeah. Record connection is local <laughs> here. Record yeah. exchange is there. I get them confused. Yeah. So the um, Nirvana thing, yeah, that's how I, I heard about them. And then Jeff got me Bleach. I started playing Bleach on the air. I saw in the Phoenix that they were going to be playing the Man Ray show. Yeah. I didn't know that they had already played a show at Green Street Station. Yeah, I didn't either. Yeah. Like, and I don't think there was even anybody there. Right. At our show yeah. at Nirvana uh, at uh, Man Ray was... Yeah. 60, 80 yeah. people tops. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but they were people that knew about the band, either yeah. from the indie circuit and college radio, yeah. or maybe from listening to my show. Yeah. Because F FNX was not playing Nirvana in a regular rotation yeah. at that time. Right. Nevermind was not out. That was still a dream in Kurt's back pocket. You know? yeah. Yeah. Um, so I called... Um, oh, what was the, the booking agent? What's her name for... Uh, Man Ray, I'm trying to. Well, anyway, I called her. I'll think of it in a second. Yeah. Early onset, folks, from smoking all that dope. <laughs> that damn dope. <laughs> um, but I called her and said, you know, is there any way do you think that I could bring the band on stage because I've been playing them on my show? Yeah. And I'd like to meet them and yeah. just get a little rapport with them, let them right. know that they've got some support from a from a commercial station, yeah. not a college station, because even stations in Seattle were not playing them right. except college. Yeah. They were a very big college band. Yeah. Um, Joyce Linehan Joyce, was the yeah. name that I was thinking. Yeah. <laughs> it is it. Fucking early <laughs> onset, man. It comes around. You have to. Get, it's, your head's like a uh, like a you know like a, a Rolodex, and you, you 
you're just trying to figure out the name. But anyway, all right, so yeah, she says, okay, yeah, you can come and do the show. So uh, I go, and I guess you were taking pictures there. Yeah. I wish yeah. I'd have known that you had those pictures. I would have yeah. used some in the book or asked yeah. you if, if I could have. Yeah. Um, because Kurt used a couple in his book. Yeah. 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 Good. Good. I'm glad that they got out. Yeah. Um, so, the, I mean, that was a different Nirvana. There was no Dave Grohl. Yeah. yeah. That was Chad Channing at the Chad, time. Yeah. And just the three of them, and they were downstairs hanging in this big room with a pool table. And we went down, and Kurt and I, uh, yeah. Kurt St. Thomas and I went in, and we wound up smoking a couple of joints with Kurt Cobain and yeah. uh, Chris and Chad. And then we were playing some pool, just kind of messing around. All of a sudden, it was time to go on. Yeah. And I said to them, y- you don't mind if I MC the show? And they were like, no, no, no. We yeah. were all buddies now. Like, yeah. No, please, you're playing a commercial <laughs> station. Yeah. They were blown away that a commercial yeah. station in Boston, yeah. a major market, one of the top five in, this, record, yeah. in the country, was playing their record. Whether it was 3 a.m., yeah. it didn't matter. Yeah. You're, you're playing it. Thank you. Yeah. So th- I think that gave Kurt Cobain a soft spot for FNX in his heart. That's why they agreed to come back and do our birthday party yeah, and remember. other subsequent things that happened with the band. Yeah. Um, so they allowed me to go on, and yeah, I introduced uh, Nirvana on stage to yeah. a very small crowd. <laughs> And uh, I just read what was off the back of a T-shirt that they had given me, which yeah. said, you know, fudge cracking, fudge packing, crack, crack smoking, smoking, Satan worshiping motherfuckers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I didn't stumble up yeah. like I did there, but, you know, <laughs> I, a, I got it right. And you can hear that. There's a live uh yeah, if you Google, that, yeah, if you you Google Dwayne online. Bruce, Man Ray, FNX, Nirvana, all, any of those keywords, yeah. you'll find it. it. It's on there, and it's on my SoundCloud.com yeah. page, yep. yeah. um, which is where you'll find my new show, American Debauchery, yeah. by the yeah. way. Yeah. So uh, getting back to writing the book, yeah, it was a, a, a long process. It took me probably the best part of two years. Yeah, um, I tried to remember everything chronologically and in hopes that maybe this will come to fruition. Yeah. Somebody somewhere will see it and they'll think, hey, let's make a movie out of this. Yeah, yeah. You know, because there's there's enough stories in oh, here. Yeah. Yeah. And it really is telling the tale of, of myself and others trying to save this type of music and expose it in a way that... It, it finally did get exposed, but it bit everybody in the ass because now you've got the Cure and Burger King commercials. Right. Yeah, yeah. So it's, it, you know, and you're going like, oh, maybe <laughs> we went a little too far because right. the Pixies just sold me a Hyundai. Right, right. So there's always that double-edged sword of the genius and then the ridiculous aspect yeah. of it. It's yeah. genius to a certain point when it gets exploited, it becomes yeah. ridiculous. Yeah. And unfortunately that's what happened with a lot of that stuff. Yeah. You know, now you're seeing eighties cruises. Like, yeah, yeah, oh, yeah, I yeah. want to go out with, you know, <laughs> tainted love and hear right. it over and over and, yeah, and yeah. to Uriah, yay. <laughs> no, shoot me. Yeah. Just like it was Kansas and foreigner back then. Yeah. Now it's that stuff. <laughs> Do you really ever want to hear what I like about you by the romantics I again? I, <laughs> I really don't. Yeah. I don't need to, let alone do I need to set sail with them. Yeah. Uh, that would be hell to me. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, really. I Really, I can't get off this boat, <laughs> and they're going to sing that song again? I know. Did you, uh, so when that stuff did start getting big, like Nirvana, do you yeah. think that was sort of the pinnacle and then it started going, well, it, like for alternative music? It certainly opened the floodgates for something that I don't think, anybody saw coming from yeah. Kurt's death to all the knockoff bands. I mean, yeah. the, the knockoff bands got so bad that, what was that band, Puddle of Mud? They were basically playing lithium. Right. Bush <laughs> was playing Nirvana songs yeah. almost note for note, and they're yeah. getting careers out of it. Yeah. You know? Yeah. It, there was a part that, that you just kind of shook your head at, at one point. I'll, I'll tell you what was a telling moment for me, and this happened about two years ago. Yeah. Uh, my parents had passed away, and I moved back to Maine to sell their property and, right. and get everything done. So one night I was like, oh, I need to go get a lighter. And I went downtown, Scowhegan, Maine, yeah. and there was uh, my choice of three lighters, Kiss, Metallica, and Nirvana. Yeah. <laughs> and I literally sat there for a second and yeah. kind of welled up and went, how <laughs> the fuck did it get to this? Yeah. Where these are my three choices <laughs> in a small little rinky-dink town. Right. And it's it just weird to see their logo yeah. after seeing them be nothing right. and and grow and grow and explode and then literally explode right. to a point where it was it was just sad. And all the death that has come out of 
the Seattle grunge scene. I know. It's nuts. I mean, I'll never get over Chris Cornell's yeah. alleged suicide. I don't know what the fuck that was. Yeah. That's yeah. right up there with Michael Hutchins. I can't right. buy either one of those guys no, that, with the talent that they had, right. the money that they had, yeah. the looks and the sexuality of Jim Morrison that right. both of them had. And that is so hard and right. rare to find. Yeah. And you wind up hanging yourself in a hotel room right. off of a door handle. Yeah, it doesn't make sense. I, I just don't get it. Yeah. I, I buy the carotene thing yeah. more than right, those right. two. Yeah. But it, apparently it's what happened. And yeah. whether it was the Adderall or right. whatever, I don't know, man. Yeah. I don't know. But I, I just remember getting up that morning and I put on Good Morning America. Yeah. And it was not their lead story. It was 20 minutes into it yeah. with, with their little news bit headlines right. that Chris Cornell had committed suicide. Yeah. Or I don't think they were saying suicide at that point. It was just that he was found yeah. dead. Yeah, yeah. And I, I kind of was like, huh. Right. You know? And then I was like, wait a minute. Right. What? What? I mean, it was one of those yeah. what the fuck yeah, moments where sense. you were like, did she just say Chris Cornell is dead? Right. How could that be? Yeah. And then, wow. I mean, at least with Bowie, some people knew that he was sick. Yeah. Others didn't. But there was a certain gracefulness to dying with dignity, mm -hmm. even though uh, a horrible thing like cancer took him from us. Right. He died with the dignity that, you know, somebody in that situation would deserve. Yeah. Not hanging from a right. meat hook in that a hotel room. A random hotel. Yeah. Just, uh, yeah. Just sad. So, you know, Kurt Cobain's death was shocking, but it wasn't all unexpected, just like right. Lane Staley. The, yeah. Lane Staley was when, not if. Yeah. You knew that it was going to come. Right. So, yeah, FNX really embraced Nirvana, and Nirvana embraced us back. They came and yeah. played the eighth birthday party, and MTV was there, and it was a, a big rigmarole. And, yeah, and that was uh, the, the week. Nevermind came out. Too, yeah, right? that was the yeah. week Nevermind came yeah. out. And then they were going to Europe. They were leaving on Monday. Yeah. And our show was on a Thursday night. Yeah. On Friday night, because Kurt had heard that it wasn't an all-ages show, which I think they maybe had wanted to have at the beginning, but it, it wasn't possible because right. we were trying to raise money, so we had to have alcohol yeah. served and everything. Right. And so anyway, remember he did a show for five bucks yeah, the yeah. next day, all yeah. ages show. I yeah. went to that show too yeah. at Axis. Yeah. Five bucks to see Nirvana <laughs> in a pit, sweat, sweaty pit of people that yeah. was just insane. Yeah. And as was the birthday party, the birthday party was oversold. Yeah. The fire marshal was oh, yeah, threatening was... to shut it down. It was crazy. I mean, the sweat was dripping off the yeah. walls. And that was there. with, uh, was that with Bullet LaVolta? Bullet LaVolta, Smashing, Smashing Pumpkins, Pumpkins yeah. and a local band called Cliffs of Cliffs Deneen. Of Deneen yeah. That was the four yeah. band roster for that particular club. Yeah, yeah. But that was that was the one to see the, the Smashing band. Pumpkins oh, yeah. and Nirvana. Now, I mean, little tidbits from that night. I think that's you know, I think most people know that Billy Corgan and Kurt Cobain, Kurt Cobain did not get along. Yeah. Very well. It started that night. Oh yeah. Because Nirvana headlined and Bullet LaVolta played before, uh, I mean, sorry, played after the Smashing Pumpkins. Yeah. So Pumpkins were second on the list. Right. And then a local band after that, and then Nirvana. Right. And I think that that started, I know that Billy was not too happy in that regard that right. night. Yeah. And I believe that Kurt met Mary Lou Lord yeah. that Probably night. Yeah. And there's a whole story with that, and uh, yeah. that came to a pinnacle at That's his whole, yeah. funeral, I guess. Yeah. Courtney chased her away and hit her with a shoe or something like that. I, I don't know. It's all crazy. I mean, it's like <laughs> there's, there's a certain, like I said, the, the double-edged sword where right. it goes from genius to ridiculous. Yeah. And I think Nirvana went kind of that way once a certain person became involved, and that, yeah. of course, would be Courtney Love. Yeah, yeah. So it, I don't know, but it's, it is what it is, and it, it, it doesn't, you know, it's going to be like the Kennedy assassination. Right. We're never really going to know yeah, what happened. Everybody right. has their inkling. We're never going to know what happened with Michael Jackson, right. whether it's all true or not, but we have an inkling. Right. And after seeing that documentary on, on HBO recently, that's, yeah. I mean, you got to look at the times that Michael was with those boys yeah. and, you, and you're going like, what? well, that kind of all makes right. sense now, you know, in, in right. some regards, but I don't know. I, it, it's just a part of life. It's yeah. not anything we have to see it, but we can't really ever do anything about it individually. Yeah. yeah. And I think that that's, um, the thought process kind of between 
uh, uh, for American Debauchery, which is the new show that I'm doing now. Yeah. It's an uncensored show. Uh, it's available on SoundCloud.com. I'm also part of the Area 51 shortwave radio network out of WBCQ, which is a station out of Holton, Maine, mm-hmm. which uh, then streams. And when you say shortwave radio, I, you right. know, a lot of people think that it's, you know, right. sounds like this. <laughs> yeah. and, and, no, it's not like that anymore. Right. It sounds a lot like FM. Does it? Okay. It's as clear and, and yeah. clean oh, uh, right. as FM is now, especially on the stream. Yeah. So they're covering it and carrying it because uh, they're against censorship as well. Right. But I'm on, I'm doing a show <laughs> that calls Trump to the carpet yeah. week after week. Uh, and I'm up against guys that are pro-Trump yeah, on yeah. the same station. On the same, yeah. So the air, you know, it's anybody can buy the airtime right. yeah, yeah. uh, that can afford it yeah. or, or wants to have it. Yeah. So fortunately for me, I, I'm not one of the guys that has to pay. I got on through <laughs> Area 51. Yeah. But there are people that want pro-Trump stuff, yeah. and they so they'll pay like 30 bucks right. a week to yeah. have a spot. <clears throat> huh, interesting. Oh, it's yeah. weird. That's what I mean, that the whole... Uh, decommissioning of radio that uh, Clinton did, yeah, uh, and kind of pulling the FCC off of everybody's back was was good. But now, you know, when you're leaving Maine today, just go up and down the dial. Yeah, it's going to be religion, 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 politics. Yeah, probably pro Trump. Yeah, still bashing Obama, still bashing right. Hillary. Yeah. then you're going to get to a moldy oldie station. Right. Then you're going to have a sports thing, and then you're going to go right back to religion, <laughs> yeah. and then politics, and then moldy oldie. Yeah, it's basically lather, rinse, repeat Is radio, it, yeah. and I want to give them something different. Yeah, so I I'm under the same mental process that I have always been. Give the yeah. best show. Uh, I give you the most amount of information in the yeah. least amount of words. Yeah. Nobody likes a lengthy talking DJ. Right. Yeah. Uh, so I let the music do the talking. Yeah. Yeah. And after a week, like we have week after week, when, you know, especially for two years with the Mueller probe going yeah. on and everything, by the time Friday night comes around, you want to rock out. You yeah, want to laugh a little a bit. Release. You want a parody. You want to have a drink and a smoke and yeah. maybe just hear some Ramones and some Nine Inch Nails and yeah. some Ministry and Rage Against the Machine. Yeah. And it, does, it does sort of bring... I listen to the one you sent me. Yeah. And uh, it definitely has that spirit of like when I listened to radio when I was a teenager. Sure. A little bit of badassness to it. You know, not a lot, and I'm certainly not a badass, but I can (laughs) portray one on the radio musically Mm -hmm. by, you know, playing the new Mud Honey and the new Bad Religion. I I play a lot of new music and new releases on the show, but I think I'm geared at Really, to anybody that grew up listening to alternative radio, yeah, yeah. probably in a 35 to 55 spectrum, yeah. male, female, it doesn't matter. Yeah. I mean, you're going to hear comedy, parody, yeah. and I'm going to rock your ass off. Yeah. And I mean, it might make you think a little bit. Yeah. You know, That's all I'm trying to do is still educate through music. Yeah. It's not so much what I say, it's right. what the musician says. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And having the fact to be able to play now everything uncensored really gives it a dynamic that I've never really been able to present before. And when I was talking about the Ice Cube songs, having to edit them, yeah. the song called Arrest the President, yeah, when you turn the fucks backwards or you edit them out or whatever, the song still has impact, but yeah. it doesn't have the type of impact right. as hearing it as Ice Cube as it wanted is. it yeah. delivered. Yeah. This is the product that I'm giving you, right. accept it as is. Yeah. And I, I got tired of just taking, you know, f bombs out right. and all of this stuff constantly all the time. Yeah. So sometimes I'd miss them, and then I'd right. get called on the carpet for that because yeah. the show was airing on a uh, an actual radio station, and that's w- why I stopped that particular show and started American Debauchery because yeah. I, I wanted to do an all online show yeah. with the exception of the shortwave aspect of it, yeah. uh, where it could be totally uncensored. Yeah. And it's not like a, you know, like I said with the Howard Stern thing, it's not that I want to get on and say fuck every other word. Right. As a matter of fact, I kind of made a deal with myself. The only F-bombs I'm going to drop are if it's in a song title. Yeah. If I'm playing Fuck the Police by NWA and they've said it 18 that. times, right. there's no harm with me saying yeah. it a 19th. Right. But I don't need to just go, oh, fuck him, he's stupid. Right. Because that that doesn't yeah. get anything anywhere. Right. Shock value. I'm not after yeah, shock point, value. Yeah. I'm after right. education value. Yeah, yeah. I'm doing the same thing that I did 30 years ago yeah. in hopes that it's having some effect, some impact somehow. I, yeah. There were people that listened to me on TOS mm-hmm. years ago that I'm friends with now on Facebook who yeah. say, like, I was able to 
you know, grow musically yeah, listen, because of listening stuff. to your show. Yeah. And now my kids have yeah. reaped that benefit through my collection your of collection. stuff. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, I, I think the same thing, you know, I don't know if, uh, how your relationship musically was with your parents, yeah. but my parents always had music on in the house, but it was a very country and Western type yeah. of house. I was raised on Johnny Cash yeah. and Merle Haggard and Hank Williams and, Kitty Wells and Patsy Cline, all these, you know, the the big, the big, country. yeah, the early when it was country and Western and not the modern right. day country that it is now. But you fought against that, you know, oh, come on, I want to hear the Beatles. I want to right. hear some Rolling Stones. You go yeah. on a camping trip or whatever. Let me have the radio <laughs> for a little bit. Yeah. And, but it comes back on you later. Your parents influence. Yeah. Who would have thought that I'd be out there buying Johnny Cash CDs yeah, and yeah. Hank Williams box sets yeah, no, because that music is pure. Yeah, yeah. It's beautiful. Yeah. It's amazing and it's timeless. Yeah. And it deserves to be heard yeah. and, and cherished yeah. because there's nothing else like it. Yeah. And it, it was in a certain era of, of uh, music and it's preserved and you can enjoy it, but you're never going to have it again. Yeah, yeah. And that's one of the bummers of life. But... Then I go and I listen to the new Ice Cube, and I'm like, yeah. oh, thank God I live in 2019 <laughs> yeah, where somebody yeah. can express themselves yeah. like this. Can yeah. you imagine if Hank Williams dropped an F-bomb <laughs> I know, right? on the Louisiana Hayride? Yeah. Uh, I'm pretty sure that the sponsors, <laughs> uh, I'm sure Digel would have been uh, out of there. Yeah, yeah. So where? Uh, so if people would like to listen to you, uh, where can they do that? They can listen on SoundCloud.com uh, under Dwayne Bruce and the show American Debauchery. Yeah. I also had been doing, uh, as I referenced earlier, I was working with a, a radio station, still am, out of Skowhegan called WXNZ. Mm -hmm. It's a commercial-free community station that's actually on the commercial band at 98.1, not oh, on the okay. lower band. Yeah. So, uh, it, but it's commercial free and it's, uh, anything goes station. Oh, you nice. can play whatever you want as far as, um, the music. Right. It's not so much where you can speak your mind right. because it is a community radio station right. in a small town, yeah. but I had been doing a show on there and, and it, it comes out of a jail cell, believe it or not. Oh, wow. It's out of the old Somerset County jail, which yeah. they've refurbished. And that jail is now a complex that has main grains, which is a working grain mill. Yeah. Uh, there's a restaurant, there's a knitting shop, and there's a radio station. Huh. So, and, you know, it's still in jail cells. All the cells, we have our own block. One cell is the station, one yeah. cell is um, a production studio. Huh. So because of the jail aspect of it, I was doing a show called Rock and Parole. Yeah. Because we all have, like, jail-type names, right. cell block rock or whatever, right. something like that. But Rock and Parole is done in American debauchery. But I reference that because you can find a lot of rock and paroles also on uh, SoundCloud.com. Right. And if you're looking for uh, the book, Hang the DJ, that's available on Lulu.com, mm -hmm. Amazon.com, and you can pick it up if you're here in the Northeast. Yeah. Newbury Comics has it, and yeah. Bull Moose Music has it. Yeah, I, I actually saw one in Bull Moose yesterday. Oh, down good. In Portland, so. Excellent. Yeah. Excellent. That means nobody's it. buying it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure people pick it up and go, what the... Yeah. What? Hang the DJ. <laughs> I'm sure Morrissey yeah. wants, you know, wants to read that book. Yeah. Uh, well, thank you very much for uh, doing this, man. I thank you, Christian. I, I, I greatly uh, appreciate the fact that you came here yeah. and uh, came to my home and spoke with me. I, I hope people enjoy the show. I mean, it's, it is what it is. It's, it's 2019, and we're facing um, possibly... The same turd in the punch bowl being there for another four years. We don't really yeah. know what's going to happen. No, nothing's definite. But if we were fooled the first time around, we can be fooled again. And yeah. we don't need Russia to fool us. You know, we've we got a good job of doing <laughs> that ourselves. We're, right. Sometimes we're not the brightest bulb in the box. Right. And I think that was proven in, in the last election. Mm -hmm. I, I wonder how many people that voted for him would like to take that back. Yeah. But he's got that strong 33%, so you never know. If he can build on that, right. we just might be screwed. But if we are, I'll be there to mock it. Yeah. <laughs> that's one thing you can count on. That's, that's you know, with a name like American debauchery, it's the debauchery isn't really the sex, drugs, and rock and roll aspect. Right. The debauchery is... Everything that we What's see in the, in the news, yeah. and not necessarily just the, the political aspect of it, yeah. but the murders that we see, and yeah. you can't even get into a friggin' Uber without yeah. getting knifed. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I mean that's debauchery. Yeah. So we address it all, and uh, I play a lot of music around it, and hopefully you'll tune in and hear it. Awesome. Thanks, man. Thank you. Yeah.